Greetings, everybody, and welcome back to Ask the Jegna. We're going to have another good installment. Last week, we talked a lot about healing and a lot about you know people's lives. People shared their stories. Um, it was pretty powerful, and hopefully we'll have a continuing conversation like that today. For some reason, my eyes look crazy red. That's kind of funny. <laughs> I must be tired. I don't know what's going on, but uh, it's good to be back. I hope everyone's doing well. hope everyone started their week off in a productive way. I hope everybody's weekend was constructive uh, or as constructive as possible. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, cross-generational healing. And we're also going to talk about Black political seriousness, as well as we're going to discuss some strategies on how to just deal with some of the things that are going on uh, today. So... I sent out a uh, kind of a filler today to see what were some of the things that people had on their mind that they would like to hear me talk about or just discussed in general. Uh, and these were the topics that came up. So I'm going to try to do justice to the best of my ability. And if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the comments section. I will, I will grab them and I will go ahead right on ahead and answer your questions uh, tonight. So, and feel free, if you would like to dive into the conversation tonight, I'll be sharing a link a little bit later so you can join us as well. If you're catching us on the playback, don't be afraid to let us know what you think about the show in the comments section. Uh, and I appreciate folks who've been subscribing to the YouTube channel. My numbers have gone up. Um, you know, I'm in the 300s now, which ain't nothing to big time YouTubers, but it's something to me because, you know, I didn't think nobody was really going to follow along with the <laughs> what I got going on. Hotel, hey, Lena. Uh, so make sure you subscribe, make sure you share if you find this broadcast to be constructive. So let's get into some of the topics I'll share as people kind of come on in. Um, I'll share some, some of my thoughts. So, you know, for people that don't know, for the last 11 years, I've been doing work around trauma. My trauma work has been influenced by a man by the name of Sam Simmons. I give most of my credit to Sam. Without Sam, I probably wouldn't be doing trauma work at all. I don't know what I'll be doing, um, to be completely honest with you. But Sam was the first person who highlighted this concept and this ideal of what we're going through as Black people as trauma. And that led me down a road of just studying and working in trauma through all different types of levels and elements, the main ones being historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, and then racial trauma or race-based trauma. So that's the work that I've been doing professionally for the last 11 years. At that time, when I started doing the trauma work, I was in my first master's program. And I have a master in that program, I have a master's in community psychology. And um, I was interviewing people for my master's thesis. And Sam Simmons was one of those people. And he was literally like my third interview. And I remember after I got done talking to him, I had to halt everything I was doing and change a lot of my the direction of my master's thesis. Now, for folks that don't know how that works, once you get your thesis or your idea approved by something called HSRB, um, or it's not HSRB, IRB, sorry, <laughs> it's a whole other acronym. The IRB, which is the uh, Internal Review Board, every university has it on the graduate level, uh, and even some professors have to utilize that when they're attempting to publish work. So you have to have a review board. And the reason for that is back in the day when folks, um, you know, were doing psychological studies, white folks, <laughs> there was a lot of harm being done to people. And there's a lot of books that talk about that. Um, Zimbardo is one of the, the bigger psychologists that talks about some of the harm that was being done to people. And there was no ethics. There was no ethic community. People just did whatever. And what happened in the, I believe, the IRB came around in either the late 60s, it might be the early 60s, but somewhere between the 60s and the 70s, the IRB was created to make things more ethical. So for me, I couldn't change 100% uh, of my focus for my master's thesis. Otherwise, I would have had to go through an IRB process all over again. But meeting Sam shifted and, and really put a label on this thing called trauma for me. So I had to change a little bit of the direction within my master's thesis. And from there, it was on. I, I had finally had the answer to what I was seeing and what I was feeling in the community on what was happening. And it was trauma. And I learned the concept of something's not wrong with you. Something happened to you. He was the first person I ever heard say that. I know many people say that now. But, you know, that gave me a, I, that gave me pretty much a label to what was going on. I couldn't put my finger on it, but that gave me a label to what was going on as far as our journey and moving forward. 
And from there, like I said, I dived into many different things. One of the more notable things is I became one of the state of Minnesota's um, ACE uh, ACE facilitator trainers. And what ACE is, is adverse childhood experiences. So I became um, an adverse childhood experience. And if you're not familiar with ACEs, go ahead and Google it. You can put ACE study in there. And ultimately what the ACE study is, is a pretty big research project that took place between 1995 and 1997 with two medical doctors, Dr. Anda and Dr. Uh, Valetti. Valetti. And these two doctors were medical doctors from UCAL Berkeley. And what they were studying was obesity. And they're known for studying um, people who have chronic obesity. They had a really big, massive study they did in the 80s. And one of their discoveries from that big, massive study in the 80s was most of the people who had uh, chronic obesity had some kind of childhood experience, adverse childhood experience. So like good researchers, what did they do? They decided to say, hey, let's find some, some dollars because that's what this game's all about, funding, and let's look at this particular problem. They were able to team up with the CDC and they were able to team up with Kaiser Permanente, which is an insurance company that's kind of mostly based on the West Coast, but you know it's an insurance company, so you can get it. But the team that were both of them, and they did this massive survey around what's now known as adverse childhood experiences. In the massive survey, they surveyed over 17,000 participants. That's a big survey. If you've ever did like a research project, if you went to college or even in high school, you would know that um, you know doing something that massive is pretty significant. So they were able to survey these folks. Now, these folks who did the actual survey were folks who... Um, who had this insurance. So that's important because that's a selective group of people. So they had to have this insurance in order to participate in this survey. Um, also, in order to have this insurance, you had to have a pretty, uh, I don't want to say a fluent job, but you had to have a pretty decent um, uh, job to have this level of insurance. So that even made the pool of people even smaller. But the results from the study is why we know what the ACE study is today. Because the results of the study highlighted that if, if children from conception to about 17 years old, 18, if you want to go to 18, if they have an adverse childhood experience, and I'll talk about what those are in a second, that from that adverse child experience, they can end up creating, oh, I should just show it, um, they, what ends up happening is they end up creating um, some neural disruption. And ultimately, from that neural disruption, they'll develop coping skills or coping mechanisms. And then from there, it can you can develop social ills, you can develop physical health issues, mental health issues, etc. And then ultimately, at the top of the pyramid, becomes this thing known as um, early death. And the reason, when I said this, the reason why we know about this study is because it was normalized on a mainstream or dominant population, which are white folks. And, and that's what I always say. That's the reason we know about this thing called ACEs. We know about this thing called ACEs because it was normalized on the mainstream population. And white folks said, uh-oh, we got trauma too that we got to deal with. And when white folks said, we got trauma too that we got to deal with, now it's time to now it's time to put a label on it, give it a name, and focus on how do we kind of move forward and heal from the trauma. So matter of fact, while I'm talking about this, let me get into professor mode real quick and start sharing some screens and showing a few things give me a second because you know everything's always better with visuals um i th hope y'all can see that if you can see that when i put it in full screen typo put a one in the chat for me i'm gonna put it in full screen put a one in the chat if you can see it whoops i ain't trying to give y'all all, all the heat there we go so again this a study is built from um, it's this pyramid. This pyramid is like the logo of the ACEs. So if you ever Google adverse child experiences, you'll see a pyramid that looks something like this. And the idea behind the pyramid is at the bottom level, you have an adverse childhood experience. Then it leads to a disrupted neural development, which means that your brain starts to adjust to the experiences that you've had as a child. That adjustment is usually through your synapse connection when your synapse connection is how you really learn about your environments and how to maintain your safety. It's the development of your brain. From there, then you have social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. And then from that space, it increases the probability of these next three things, adapting to health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and then and ultimately early death. So that's what, that is what 
um, the ACE study in a nutshell kind of highlights. And it was fascinating when I learned about this, when I learned about this ACE study, because I, I looked at the demographics and when we got trained in, they, they broke down the demographics. And about 70, I think it was either 76 or 77% of the people who took it were Caucasian. Uh, there were more women who took it, but not a huge you know, amount more. It was like, I think it was 54% women. Um, most people had some college experience, whether they graduated or just went to a two year or they had some college experience. Um, and most of these folks graduated high school. So the, the, it was not normalized on a diverse population at all. There were some other people in there, but I mean, 75%, I mean, it's a majority white study, which is, again, why I say we know about ACEs is because of that. What the survey looked at was these three areas, and it asked questions on these 10 things. So, it had, so one of the areas was abuse, the second area was neglect, and the third area was household dysfunction. Abuse was divided into three areas, or three sub-areas, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Neglect was divided into two areas, physical neglect and emotional neglect. Household dysfunction was divided in mental illness, or you had a parent or a caregiver in the home who had a mental illness. You had an incarcerated relative, which was actually a parent from the questionnaire. But, you know, there you go. Your mother was treated violently. So intimate partner violence or domestic violence, substance use, and then ultimately divorce. Now, look at these. I look at these and I think about the community that I come from. I look at these and I think about the experiences that I've had. I look at these and I think about what my A score is, which is high as hell. <laughs> and what I learned is I got scared because one of the major findings from the original A study and the research that came afterwards was that if you had said yes on that questionnaire to four of these 10 things, it, it, it dramatically increased your probability of having mental health issues and or social issues and or physical health issues. And one of the things that was pointed out and highlighted was if you had a score of four or more, your life expectancy rate was, uh, in, it was significantly lower than other folks. And as a black man who pays attention to stuff like life expectancy rates of black men, it made a lot of sense to me because we die quicker in this country <laughs> than anyone else. I mean, sometimes depending on the state and the region you're in, sometimes indigenous men will you know, over, overshadow us by a few percentages, but not often. And that's something that we can't let go of. So when we talk about cross-generational healing, we can't have that conversation without knowing what are we healing from and what is contributing to the issues that we end up having. So let me get out of professor mode for a second to just check in. All right, people can see that. Great. And welcome to the show. The Andrea bag. What's up, Brian? Brian, you've been busy, man. I seen you over at Philippe's channel earlier in the comments. Hey, Keisha, thank you for giving me a suggestion today. What's up, Greg? I seen you over there too. What's up, VC? Hola, what's good? So welcome to the show. So again, the A study, all right, that's that this is the premier trauma study that is utilized all over the world, by the way. This is not a United States thing. This A study is utilized in many different governmental entities, social service uh, organizations or nonprofit organizations. It's used in schools. Um, it's used in gov I just said governmental entities. It's used in many different places to understand how childhood trauma has a significant impact on people's development. So it's important for er for us, folks who ain't in those worlds, because a lot of people who watch me and who subscribe to my channel, they don't know nothing about no aces, but they do, but they don't. They don't know it in this form, but they really know about aces because they lived it. And when I the funny thing, when I got trained in this, I got trained in this in 2013. Yeah, 2013, I was a Bush fellow. And I remember when we were in class or in this training and um, we were talking about this particular area. And then they said, all right, now we're going to have you all do your own ACE questionnaire. So literally, you can download this questionnaire, by the way. You just type in ACE study questionnaire. You can find it on Google for free. It's a PDF download. And the first question on the ACE questionnaire says, has an adult ever pushed, shoved, swore at you, or insulted you? And I just bust out laughing. And now everybody's quiet because we're all supposed to be taking our little you know, quiz. And I'm just cracking up like, this is wild. Because every adult that I know has told me to sit my little black ass down at some point in time in my life. And, that, and it wasn't in, in a way of harm. It was just, that's what they said. I mean... So to, to a certain extent, people still get told that when they're adults by the elders, where they where we come from. 
And already just with that, just with that, it highlighted to me that there was a culturally there, that this is not a culturally responsive tool. And this tool is not going to be that effective without putting a cultural lens on it. But this is the mainstream tool that is informing a lot of things. One of the ways that this became a mainstream tool was one, the CDC was behind it. But a couple years ago, there was a pretty popular documentary film um, that was based out of a school in Washington. I can't remember where in, in the state of Washington it was based, but the documentary is called Paper Tigers. And Paper Tigers, they took the A study and they started to have more of a trauma informed school and they started to see better results. And that, I mean, that movie helped kind of spark even a bigger fire than ACEs already was doing. And this idea of ACEs has just spread across the United States. And like I said, has even got outside to other countries as well. But one thing that's dangerous about this, if we don't be honest about the work we need to do, is if you don't put a cultural lens on ACEs, you may be causing more harm to young brown and black children than others. And I say that intentionally because it ain't just black children that this is getting done to. Um, this has been this has been informed on a lot of different people. Let me show uh, some more from this presentation since I'm in professor mode. And I'm grooving. So let's go. So from the ACEs, it leads to all these issues. These are just some issues. There's plenty more that have been connected to the ACE study. Lack of physical activity. That was my issue. I used to hate working out. Even though I was an athlete, working out was always a, a chore. Smoking, alcoholism, drug use, miss work or miss school, right? So that's productivity being low. Severe obesity, diabetes, depression, Suicide attempts or suicidal ideation. There's a difference between the two of those, and I can break them down if somebody wants me to. Just go ahead and ask in the comments section. STIs or STDs, heart disease, uh, including hypertension, which is not a heart disease, but can lead to one. Cancer, stroke, COPD, and then broken bones, which is ultimately just being more prone to injury. So we know that if you have high ACE scores, it can lead to all these issues. So again, then I think about my community, where I come from. What do I see? I see all of this happening sometimes in one day, in one family unit, in one dynamic, sometimes in one person. Because the ACEs is too damn high. <laughs> I don't know if people remember that dude who, uh, who was running. I think he was running for mayor or something in New York. And it's like the rent's too damn high. <laughs> the ACEs are too damn high. And that's what ended up happening is we see this every day. Now, there have been attempts over the years to, quote unquote, normal, not normalize the study, but replicate the study to meet more of an urban population. One of the more um, notable attempts was in Philadelphia, where they had the Philadelphia A study. And what they did, it was Philadelphia in the greater Delaware, Delaware area. And what they did was they did the same study, but they added some additional questions. They were smart. They said, look, we know. We know we can't just ask the same questions because these questions aren't culturally responsive to black kids or to, I mean, to non-white kids. Let's say it that way, non-white kids. So with the Philadelphia study, now they didn't study as many people. 17,000 people in a survey is a lot of people. But the Philadelphia study was able to, uh, I think they had like 1,700. So about 10% of the original study, which is still good. Getting 1,700 people to answer a survey is doing pretty damn good work, especially for a coalition that's trying to do work in a particular area like that, in a metropolitan area. From that, from that Philadelphia A study, they, were, they had 36% of the people who took it were African-American. 11% of people who took it were classified as Hispanics. And 34, or sorry, 39% of the people who took it were classified as white. So they had a little bit of a wider range, a closer comparison between white and black participants. The education plummeted. I mean, it was like, you know, in the original A study, there was like 94% of those folks graduated high school. In the Philadelphia study, 36% of those people graduated high school. So now we're talking about people who are going to be just from an educational standpoint, lower on the economic development scale. From that original, uh, sorry, from that Philadelphia A study, what they added, they added uh, five areas. They added, they added, actually, let me just show you. They added six areas, six additional areas. Boom. 
So they had the original A study questions, remember abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, but then they also added their own areas. So they added a question about experience and racism. They added a question about witnessing violence. They added a question about living in an unsafe neighborhood. Do you feel like you live in a war zone was the question. Now that's crazy. Now think about that. They asked the question in Philadelphia, do you feel like you live in a war zone? And a lot of people answered that question and said, yeah. Do you have experience being in foster care? And do you have experience in being bullied? Now, that was an interesting question. And I thought the way that they termed it, I can't remember exactly verbatim how they termed it, but I would have asked that question a little bit differently because we know in our community, bullying looks different than the other community. In the black community, bullying looks different. We call it frame, <laughs> flaming, frying, roasting, playing the dozens for all my old school folks. That's technically bullying, but we don't see that as bullying. We see that as a verbal exchange of just teasing and playing around. But in the system, they see that as bullying and our kids get in trouble for it all the time. And we have to, we have to, we have to be very mindful of that. So for me, when I talk about ACEs and I'm starting this conversation tonight about this ACE study, because one, many people don't know about it. Many people on my Facebook that y'all have no idea what the hell I'm talking about right now, but you experience it every day. Your children, your nephews, your nieces, the kids that live next door to you, the kids that live under you in the apartment building in a different unit, they're experiencing ACEs all the time. And it's not even the stuff that is on that list. There's so many things that aren't on that list, like being in poverty. Right. They talk about divorced parents. What about parents that never got married at all? What about parents that you were born on a hookup? I mean, my parents were Netflix. I mean, they didn't have Netflix. They were VHS and chilling. That's how I came into the world. <laughs> like that's an ace right there. Like there was no intention for a family for Brandon. When Brandon was born, it was just we like we cool. We like each other. We hooked up and boom, baby was made. God said it's time. Like, that's an ace in itself. We don't think about that. What about the ace when, you know, when you have a young person who doesn't know who their biological parent is? I mean, there's some kids that I've dealt with. They don't know where their mother is or their father. And they've been they've been placed in systems from the from a very early age. And that's important for us to understand that these things affect us. And a big tool like this, it's helpful to give a small framework, but it doesn't tell the complete story. And we have to tell that complete story in our healing journey. So when we talk about cross-generational healing, we're talking about the stuff that we have experienced. Yes, Keisha, absolutely. Most of us did come from unmarried parents. Most of us still coming from unmarried parents. Most of us, even before our generation, came unexpectedly, right? There was no intention to have us. It was just like, oh, we pregnant again. That That's our experience. I'm not saying that that's a negative thing, but without intentionality, what do you do next? Especially if there's no intentionality after we find out we have conceived a child. That's one of the bigger things because now it creates friction. It starts to begin the cycle of the cross-generational healing. Let me show another slide from the slide day. I ain't, I ain't going to be coming on here every Monday doing presentations. <laughs> Y'all going to have to call a brother. We can set up, set up a, a training for everybody. But but I do go over some of this in the course. Matter of fact, I need to plug myself better. Uh, you can go ahead and find the Legacy of Trauma course down in the description. If you're on YouTube, up top, if you're on Facebook, you can click on that, get the course. Um, and and I go through I go deep dive through all of this, but there's but it's important for us to understand that childhood lasts forever. We don't think it does, but it does. The impacts and the things that we experience have a as a child have an effect on us our entire lives. But one thing we have to keep in mind with that is most of our trauma started before we were even born, and that's a hard pill to swallow. Trauma doesn't happen in a vacuum. All the mo most of the time, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Sometimes it can. But most of the times it doesn't. When we're talking about intergenerational healing, that's the stuff that doesn't happen in a vacuum. So the solutions can't happen in a vacuum either. Most people, when, when I talk about ACEs, when I do the work with Sam, and, and, when, and Sam's been pushing this even longer than the folks who kind of run the ACEs, of some of the bigwigs and ACEs, they started to adapt this, but they really got this from him. 
Because he, he makes it to that level. And then they get scared of the big black man. So then they just have pushed him to the side, <laughs> which is messed up. But that's a whole nother trauma. But we he's been talking about this and influencing me to talk about this for years. The trauma starts before people are even born. It starts with the intergenerational and healing or intergenerational and historical trauma. Then it goes to what we call the social conditions or local context. What does that mean? That's talking about the environments and the situations that people are in. Then it gets to the adverse childhood experience and the complex trauma because a lot of times people are born with trauma right behind them. I'm born from a teenage mother who was pregnant with me during her senior year of high school. Do you know what that did to her, her mother, my grandmother? The friction that that caused between the two of them. What kind of I, what kind of mentality does that put on a family? Nobody wants to. I mean, nowadays it's a lot more acceptable, but back in those time, who wants to have the teenage daughter who got pregnant? That's a shame in the community. At that time, it's commonplace now, but at that time, there was different types of understandings on what is what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing culturally in the community. Then it gets to the disrupted neurodevelopment, social, emotional, cognitive impairment. Then it gets to how we cope. And in our in our community, the black community, and, and we can say this for some of the other BIPOC communities as well, the coping with the coping has been commodity. It has it has become a commodity in how we cope. It has become an industry, many uh, multiple industries in how we cope, and it has become socially acceptable for us to cope in unhealthy ways. And then that's when it leads to the disease, disability, and social problems, and ultimately the early death. So when I think of ACEs, when I'm in meetings or I get called into conferences, when people say, Brandon, we want you to come speak to us about that, this is what I'm talking about. I don't start with the adverse childhood experience because there's a history and a story behind that that informs what has happened to that young woman or that young man. Or should I just say that young person? And without understanding that context behind them, you're not doing the justice that you need to do to help this young person learn, grow, develop, et cetera. Without understanding that context, and we can, we can even personalize it, without understanding that context for yourself, and you go on and try to create and establish a family or be in a, a healthy relationship, it's hard for you to do that. It's funny to me that in our community, I hear this all the time. People DM me, they email me, they text me. I'm like, how y'all get my number? <laughs> they text me. And they're like, Brandon, help me with my relationship. I'm sick of being in relationships that have all this baggage. What is baggage? Baggage is that historical trauma, that stuff that we have experienced. It's not, and guess what? Most of the baggage that we have in our relationships in this generation isn't from dealing with other bad relationships. It's from dealing with our dysfunctional families and the communities we come from. Let's keep it real. I mean, we just got to talk. We, we got to be, <laughs> we just got to be on point. We just got to be uh, honest about that. Like a lot of that trauma comes from somewhere that's even beyond the relationships. So that's something that I want to talk. So when we talk about intergenerational healing, and if, you, if you're someone who's thinking, well, how can I do this for myself? I know that I'm one who needs to do some healing. You need to understand your family dynamic first. This is, what, this is where me and the conscious community bump heads. Because the conscious community wants to skip over their family dynamics and go straight back to Kemet. And I'm telling you, slow down. Your, 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 <laughs> your time machine needs to slow down, bro. You need to go back to mama and daddy. Figure out what happened there. If anything did happen there. Then you need to ask some questions about your family dynamic. Ask about your grandparents if you have them. Talk to your grandparents if you can. Ask them about their parents. Now you're starting to unfold the narrative of yourself. And we don't do that. We just don't. We want to go all the way back to the continent and skip over all the crazy shit that we done been through. <laughs> it's like, what, what are we doing? And then we want to get mad because our children ain't getting taught their history, but they don't even know their own family history. 
Why would I be interested in what happened, you know, thousands of years ago when I don't even know what happened 30 years ago in my own family? We got to get real about this stuff. If we really want to do intergenerational healing, like man, we got to stop playing. Stop doing this feel-good history stuff and start getting real with it. Because once you start plugging in some of those gaps, piecing together some of those puzzles, it gives you pride and identity in who you are. It also helps you uh, build your resiliency because it then helps you identify, oh, I ain't crazy. This is how I got here. And it helps you humanize the people in your family. Now, some of our family members have done some really awful things to us. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. But it does if some of those things happen to you. Like one of the big things that we don't talk about, but I'm definitely going to do a show on, is sexual abuse in our community. Now, we act like that's another ethnicity's issue, and it is. But it's also ours, too. I know so many. The reason why, I'm going to tell a quick story. The, the reason why I even had the thought to become a therapist I was in. I was at the University of Minnesota, sophomore year. I was living in Roy Wilkins Hall, where all the athletes live. It's where all the college, some of the the good hoopers live in. Roy, now they got all types of apartment complexes, so they probably don't even stay there now. But back in my day, that's where all the good basketball male basketball players lived. So if you're good, you live in a Roy Wilkins. That's where the female basketball players live, and some of the other athletes were kind of spread throughout there. And I had these three females that I was cool with. And this, and this is in one semester, too, which really kind of like threw me off and had me thinking about what to do. Yeah, you was at Sanford. <laughs> I was at Sanford. Yeah, Roy Wilkins. I started off at Sanford. I read Roy Wilkins. Andrea, tell y'all I ain't lying. And I met, I met three women in one semester, three girls. One of them I was actually trying to holler at. The other two I was cool with. And all three of these girls, not at the same time, but in the same semester. Now, a semester is like four months. I had three different black women, black women in college, tell me that they were sexually assaulted either by someone in their family or a close family friend. And I'm like, at, after the second one, I'm like, dang, this is weird because homegirl just told me this like a month ago. And then the third one told me, and I was like, man, what the hell's going on? At that time, I never met, I, that I know of, I never really met somebody who's been sexually assaulted that shared that with me. And I'm like, damn, something's going on here. And then I remember talking to my friend, Chris, shout out to McDuff. And I was like, he might not remember this, but I was like, man, I don't know what's going on, dude, but people keep coming to me with their problems <laughs> and I don't know how to feel about it, man. I should be getting paid for this. And he was like, maybe you should. Like, that's, that's how Chris is. He was like, maybe you should, man. And I was like, damn, I could probably become a therapist. That's, that was the really the first time I thought about becoming a therapist because I had these women who just kind of confided in me. And then I started to take these sociology classes and, and then started to look at sexual abuse just in general and how, how prevalent it is. So it's just like, damn. And then starting to understand that when black boys, because I know a lot of black boys, their first sexual experience was with a significantly older woman and how black boys are subject to sexual abuse. And we don't even recognize that. Because if a 13 year old pops a 25 year old female, we giving him dap and credit. That's sexual abuse, though. And then you got to ask this young woman, what was she thinking trying to have sex with a 13 year old? Like we have to keep it real. Sometimes these teachers, too. But man, I, I, for years on Facebook, I've been sharing stories of teachers having sex with students. And a lot of those students end up being black boys and nobody says anything about it. But Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Dr. Tommy Curry, those are the only two black professionals that I know that have verbally talked about this. Black, uh, not professionals, professors. I mean, this is real. So when we hear little Boosie say he bought his 13-year-old son, I think he turned 13, something like 13, 14-year-old son, a stripper for his birthday, man, we got to, that is not cool, man. But in this, in this point in time in society, we just kind of brush over that when it comes to our boys, but our boys are being manipulated every day, which is kind of interesting because Tariq Nasheed's putting out a movie called Butt Breaking. That's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but. But the sexual abuse thing is real. That's real. That's something we got to keep in mind. So anyway, the traumas, getting back to the point, the traumas that folks go through, we don't talk about all the time. I started talking about sexual abuse and my numbers went down. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the trauma that we go through in our community is hard and we can't do this in isolation. So when we talk about cross-generational healing, 
We have to be one honest about what happened. We need to ask questions from the people that are around us, our family members. We got to ask questions uh, from our community. That's another thing too that we need to understand is our journey. How do we get where we're at? You know, I'm from Minnesota, born and raised. I'm a fourth generation, third generation Minnesotan. Right? My daughters are fourth generation Minnesotans. A lot of black people here in Minnesota, they only been here for maybe one or two generations. But you should be asking questions. Why did your people come here? Or why did your people go anywhere? Like, what? how did we get to this place? What was it about my family that had to move? Now, many people come to Minnesota because they know they can get help here. There's a lot of financial opportunities to get on your feet, whether that's through a job, whether that's through some you know, assistance program, or whether that's you coming from college and you're coming to one of these Fortune 500 companies or one of our health related com or healthcare companies that we have here to work. That's how many black people get here. And it's important to understand why did your people get to where they're at? So if you're out in Cincinnati, Ohio, or you in St. Louis, or you in Oakland, California, when you are in those types of places, what was the narrative that brought your family there? That is a part of your healing journey. It's understanding where your people actually came from. And then if you then try to go as far back as you can, because you start to learn all these things and it starts to make sense why people act the way that they do and why people do the things that they do. But you can't just brush over your family history and go straight back to Kemet. Like if you do that, you are missing a huge part of your healing journey and you're creating a false ideal of who you are. And I, and, and, and I, I know I'm going to get flack for saying that, but that is the truth because you're missing a piece to your puzzle. <laughs> Shout out to Coyote. Bo <laughs> Boosie crazy, man. <laughs> but that's Louisiana, too. Like, quiet as it's kept, Louisiana has a pretty deep history with sexual abuse of bo both black men and black women. There's a lot. If you know people from Louisiana, ask them some stories, especially older people. There's a lot of sexual abuse history in Louisiana. And I and I and a lot of that has to do with the set the slave trade that took place and the French influenced culture. If we want to get true about it. But again, if you want to talk about cross-generational healing, this is where it starts with you. And as and the other thing that's important about it is you can't start blaming people, especially the ones that hurt you. It's gonna be painful, it's not easy. But if you get caught in pointing the finger and blaming folks, you're going to end up not healing. You're going to end up harboring anger and it's going to make you feel worse. I can't get mad at my mom for the decisions that she made, even if I don't agree with those decisions. She was going through something at, at her point in time in life where she felt that was the best thing for her. That's a hard thing for an adult or even a child to understand. But for some reason, it clicked for me as a teenager and I just said, look. She going to do what she do. Still love her, though. But at some point, the healing has to begin for somebody. Most teens ain't going to get that. But when you get an adult, you shouldn't be harboring that pain for your parent. M many of my clients, I'm, <laughs> I always say this. I'm just giving you because this is from a counseling perspective, man. Many of my clients harbor so much pain from their parents. Parents that were together. Parents that never were in their lives. Parents that just said wrong, treated a different sibling differently than they treated them, and they wanted the same treatment of their sibling. They harbor so much of that anger, it blocks all their upper other opportunities in their life. They end up having bad relationship issues. <laughs> they end up parenting all types of messed up. They end up having bad relationships at work because they're harboring so much pain from that adverse childhood experience with one of their parents. I mean, we talked about this last week. We talked about this. Well, we have to be able to not blame and understand what happened. So it's important for us as we move forward that that we don't just, you know, breeze over our personal histories. We talk about cross generational healing. The other thing, too, when we talk about cross generational healing is creating moments to actually talk through what has happened. Now, that's really hard. That's really, really hard to talk through that because it means that your family has to get vulnerable. Now, I've had a few conversations with my family. We haven't had enough, and we need to have more. But one thing that I'm proud of my family for is we don't fake it. 
and I'm and when I say my family, I'm talking about my nuclear family, my my mother, and my brothers. Like we, if we have something going on, we will just deal with it. <laughs> like, like I appreciate that. There's some stuff we ain't dealt with yet, but I know we will because that's how our mom she raised us like that. Like, look, if there's an issue, we need to talk about it, and that's and that's acceptable. But I think that that's part of the healing. Is sometimes you have to accept the painful thing for you to move forward. And that's really hard for people to do because we want to go straight to blame and not just understand. And that, and it can be really hard when very nasty things have happened, like being sexually abused and stuff like that. When those types of things happen, it's hard to just accept that. But that's why therapy is necessary to help you cope and move forward. So, again, another thing on cross generational healing is being able to have those conversations with your family. And that means calling out people. And I know in our in my community, it's not easy to call somebody out and tell, you know, the experiences that happen. And a lot of people hold and harbor that pain until they die. And then they want to let off secrets in the, on their deathbed and stuff. It's like th that's part of stuff that's killing them because it stresses you out because that stuff's always in the back of your mind. Every birthday, holiday situation, you thinking about what happened. And then, you, and then something sets you off and they're like, why this person angry and mad again? And we do this stuff over and over and over again. All right. Another part of cross-generational healing is epigenetics. I'm not going to get too deep into epigenetics. I'm going to share that with you. Epigenetics, in a nutshell, is looking at the old adage and understanding of nature versus nurture. If you've ever taken a psychology class or a sociology class, you probably heard this idea of is it nature or nurture that molds a person, that helps develop a child? And what epigenetics says is it's a combination of both, which is true. I'm a big believer in that. From my field of psychology and what I've learned, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in your social dynamic and your environment play a huge role in who you are. Some people are more psychoanalytic and don't think like that, for all my nerds who understand what I just said. So <laughs> I think your environment plays a huge role in you are. So epigenetically, I have come to a conclusion that most black folks have trauma just from an epigenetic standpoint. And that's, what, that's where me and Philippe meet and we agree 100% is that there's an epigenetic experience. There's been an imprint on us due to our experience. And that's black folks, period. Whether you are on the continent, you are in one of the islands, one of the Caribbean islands, you're here in the States, you have experienced an epigenetic trauma. And you don't. many of us don't even know it. Because that di diaspora experience that we've had, the institutional racism, white supremacy that we have experienced has left a, a significant traumatic stress on us. And we've had to adapt into that. On the continent, it's more colonization. In the Caribbean islands, it's a different form of slavery. In Brazil, it's a different form of slavery. Here, it was chattel slavery. That leaves an imprint on you. So biologically, you hold and harbor stressors. So when I look at things like the ACE study and I see things like heart disease, diabetes, right, uh, chronic obesity, all th those things lead to stress-related things. Sleep apnea, <laughs> those are stress-related issues. And I'll be completely honest, I have hypertension. Now, I'm a big dude, but I ain't that damn big and I ain't that damn old either. I should not have hypertension. I was diagnosed with hypertension when I was 30 years old. One, runs in the family. Two, stress. Growing up in the household I grew up in. Even though I'm far removed from that, it's still in me epigenetically. And when I found out, I was like, damn, I know about ACEs. I got hypertension. I ain't trying to die when I'm 50 years old. I got to make some lifestyle changes, which I have. And I understood that healing is a journey. Healing is not just about dealing with things in a moment. Healing is about moving forward and continuing to find ways to cope, as I've talked about previously. So when we talk about, again, so when we talk about um, cross-generational healing, you have to be able to be honest about what's going on, figure out coping, and keep moving forward. Yeah. my Look, my father was diagnosed. This is what one of the um, people wrote in there. Look at this. Damn near everybody that's listening to me got hypertension based on these comments. <laughs> now, that's crazy. Now, think about that. Think about that. Mind you, I found out I had hypertension by mistake. That's not why I went to the doctor. I went to the doctor just to get a normal checkup because as black men, we don't take the best care of ourselves. And I, and I 
kept telling myself, I have to practice what I preach. I can't be going to the doctor once every two years. I need to go more consistently. So when I turned 30, that was my promise to myself was to go to the doctor. So I just went in just for a regular physical. And the next thing you know, and this is exactly how it happened. I was getting my blood pressure taken, which is crazy because I used to take my blood pressure all the time when I worked at the hospital and it was never that damn high. So I knew something was not right. So I'm so it's a, and it was a black woman. She was taking my blood pressure and she said, Brandon, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm good. She said, you sure, man? I said, I feel fine. I feel normal. She turned that blood pressure machine around. She said, dude, your blood pressure is 210 over like one. It was like one something. She was like, you're about to have a heart attack. I was like, what? First of all, if somebody's blood pressure is that high, don't tell them they're about to have a heart attack. That's a good way to go into panic. So I'm like, damn. So I'm like trying to calm my anxiety down. And she said, normally in these situations, we would send you to the emergency. I was at a clinic. So normally we would send you to the emergency room. But instead, because you seem to be calm and this seems to be normal for you, I'm just going to get you. I'm going to tell the doctor to prescribe some meds for you right away. And that's what happened. And then since then, I've taken my own measures to bring my blood pressure down, joined the you know, wellness clinic and all this other stuff. But again, I had to take my <laughs> I had to take my health to another serious level, because if I didn't and I would have just kept moving at the rate that I move in, I would have ended up with um, even worse health conditions. So, again, that's so to start us off, I don't spend 45 minute lecturing about intergenerational healing, but it's important for us to understand that. I wanted to make the connection between intergenerational healing and our political seriousness because somebody said, talk about the woman that was twerking. <laughs> oh, twerking at um, there, uh, before the inauguration. And I think that's just funny. First of all, you know, she was a black woman. She was an African woman, so she was black. Um, but again, that that's, uh, and then Black Lives Matter tweets it out. That's how everybody found out about it. Their Twitter account tweeted it out. But again, are we serious about our future? Or are we playing games? Now, this is a young woman, so you know you got to give her some slack. She's young. She's just doing what young people do. But it reminds me of the twerking in the restaurant and all that other stuff. Like, we got to get serious about some of this stuff. Now, again, we can't be 100% serious and be these, like, super conscious robots or whatever. But we do have to be able to have some fun and joy in our lives and take care of ourselves at the same time. Because being super serious can also lead to hypertension which I think was a contributing factor in my, my situation as I was too damn serious. I needed to chill out. But anyway, let's see. All right, I'm going to open the lines here. I need to turn a fan on, man. My wife got the heat on. Got a brother, got a brother out here getting a little warm. Okay, let me post this up. So if anybody wants to come on and ask a question or chat, I just dropped the link. Oh, did not drop in Facebook? I have to drop it myself. Give me one second. Let's see who's watching. We got some people up in here. Yeah. All right, everybody, bear with a brother while I post the link up on Facebook because it did not work the way I wanted it to. Let's see. Huh. All right, there we go. Hey. What's up, mom? Mom, you want to come on <laughs> so they so they know I ain't lying? <laughs> I bring my mama on the show. <laughs> my mom's watching. Shout out to my mom. My mom got my mom got gems of wisdom too. Don't don't get it confused. A lot a lot of my influences come from her. <laughs> to be completely honest with you. And again, you know. I always talk about I always talk about my top five influence. I think everybody should always consider who have been their influencers, who have been kind of their supports. And you know, mine have been Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, Fifty Cent, and my mom. Like those have been my top five influences on my life. And it's important for us to understand that. Like. The people that you surround yourself with have a huge influence on you. Even if it, even if you've gone through a lot, 
you can still learn and develop from that. So we'll see. We'll see if she hops on. <laughs> I dropped the link in the chat, Miles. So if you want to join us, click on that link or join me. All right. What was the other topic? Oh, political uh, seriousness. So yeah, again, you know, I, I remember I was in a meeting a few years ago in Minneapolis, um, and I got into it with a sister who I actually respect a lot. Uh, she's doing really good work. She's really bossed up over the last couple years. I'm really proud. I think she's a Bush fellow too. I'm really proud of her. But we got into a little back and forth because she challenged me because I said black people we're not politically astute. And what I meant by that is we're just we're not politically focused enough. And she said, no, we, yes, we are. And she got we got into a back and forth. And I try my hardest not to be arguing with women or just not to be arguing with anybody, but especially black women, and especially in public. So I was trying to like just back off the conversation, but she wanted to go there. So, so we kind of went there. And I was just telling her, like, you know, I don't from my experience, most of the black people I know, we don't understand politics well. And I told her, I know more about politics than most of the people that I know. And I'm talking about professional folks, not just the common day folks. And I don't know a lot. So I know that there has to be a gap. But she was like, no. And I'm like, so then I asked her a question and it kind of like shut down the conversation. I said, if we are if we are as politically astute as you believe, why doesn't anything change for us? Yeah, I threw 50 in there. <laughs> and she couldn't really say anything about it. She was just like. I don't know, Brand. I don't have an explanation. And I say, you know, part of it, yeah, because the conversation kind of took to like it was, it was white supremacy. Like that's where the conversation went. I say, yeah, absolutely, that's a part of it. But at the same time, is when I look at other groups, they're organizing the best they can in spite of white supremacy. So what what is what is our issue? Because I want I want to do more politically. And I said we just need to start locally. And maybe we need to shift our thought process communally on how we do things to get some stuff done. Yeah, lobbying, absolutely. And we should be gearing our children to become lobbyists. And as a professor, I tell you right now, and I talked about this on the Hill and Brothers podcast yesterday, I get so many black students, they want to do good. They don't know what to do next. And I'm talking about college students. And they're coming at me like, Brandon, what do you, you know, you've had me for a semester. You know, can you write me a letter of recommendation? Do you have any advice? And I do that stuff all the time for black students, helping kind of mold and steer and guide them to where they need to do. And it's just like, it's just like they just want to go to school to just go to school and get and get a good degree and get a good job without a lot of direction. We need to be saying, look, maybe you need to become a lobbyist. Maybe you need to go to law school. All right. Maybe we need to take over sectors. Um, maybe we need to just take over business sectors. Like I look at the Somali community here and they started off mm -hmm. driving taxis and then Uber and uh, Lyft popped off. They started taking over that little area and now they got their own stuff. And it's like, we got to do the same things. Oh, snap. Special guests. <laughs> My mama. <laughs> What's up, B? <laughs> What's up, mom? How are you? I'm good. Good. What's up, mom? What do you want to tell them? Anything? Anything that I lied about? What do they want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they want to know. How are you doing? Let's start there. How I'm are you doing? Good. Good. Just good. a little are you homesick, in? but I can't come back till the snow melt. <laughs> hey, I don't blame you. Stay where you at. Stay where you at. What's yeah. the weather like down there? It's like sixty-five. It's it's a little cold for Texas. Oh, but. whatever. <laughs> Meanwhile, we shoveling. <laughs> right, right, right. I ain't shoveling though. <laughs> right. So, so I have a question for you since and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Okay. So, so you're you're eight, you're 17. You right. find that you're pregnant with me. Ooh, what wait. what's going what's going through your head at that point from what you remember? Oh, uh, my mama going to kill me first. <laughs> 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 well, I really wasn't ready. I really wasn't in a relationship, so it was like, dang, I don't know. But it was my first pregnancy, and I didn't want to do anything. Terminate me. Yeah, I, you, no, you got to get rid of me. <laughs> no, I didn't want to do Thank that you. at all. Thank you, by the way. Like, okay, I'm going to have to make this work because my mom's like, look, you know, get in situations, and you got to deal with them. Right. So I just had to deal with it. I'm like, okay, we're going to make the best of this. <laughs> right. So I just made the best of. I did what I had to do. How did how did you feel that changed your mentality? Like now you're about to become Ooh. a mom. 
Oh, you're about to graduate like, high school. Like, you changed, that change my, you changed my whole life because I was real. Before I was carefree, I didn't care about nothing. I did whatever I wanted to do. I what really got my attention was one when, when I had you and we were going somewhere. And I was about to cross the street, and I stepped way back <laughs> away from the curb, and that's when I knew mm. I'm real protective. <laughs> right, right. I just that knew my whole I had responsibility, and that's if I didn't have you, I probably still would be wild and free. <laughs> <laughs> doing your thing <laughs> I'm still going to do my thing <laughs> so I calmed you down a little bit <laughs> a lot and then, then here come your brother so that just added on to it so. a whole nother level yeah gotcha. y'all was a blessing in disguise I was just really I was scared to death I didn't know what to do but mm -hmm. I figured it out Right. my thing was like you said I was trying to really right my parents' wrongs because my mom and dad didn't stay together. So that's why I probably stayed right. in a bad relationship so long. And just a lot of things, just I just kept trying to. That's why everything that happened, I explained it to you guys as it went. Like, this ain't what you do. You know, I, right. I explained everything. Yeah. So I, I didn't want you to... I knew those decisions I made wasn't great, but I was just trying to make the best of a bad situation for you guys. <laughs> right, right. And and I remember, you know, I remember one time I had to be like maybe like 11. I wasn't quite 12 yet because I didn't know that I had a different dad just yet. But I remember telling you, like, why don't you just leave? And I remember you told me something. You was like, because I want you to have a dad. And I, and I was just like, I didn't even know. I was like, damn. Cause, but the, and, that's what it was. It, that's what it was, and it was partly because when my mom and dad broke up, I was eight, my brother was six, and my I felt like my brother had a resentment towards my mom, and I and I had three boys, and I didn't want that to be with the situation with you guys. I wanted you to be, right. you know, I wanted I wanted you to have that male figure, which some most of the time. <laughs> It's, it's bad to stay in a situation that ain't good, even though right. you're trying to make something happen. Right. So I had to learn. I learned a lot fast. So. Yeah. Yeah. And w and one thing one thing I give you a lot of credit for, and I don't think I've ever told you this, so we're going to do this live. Uh -oh. I gave you a lot of credit for always being transparent with us. Even like there were times where you probably shouldn't have been telling us stuff, but you did. And I always appreciated that. And I've always kept that with me. To keep it real with people, even if it's uncomfortable, because it's better for it to be out than to keep it in. And that, that's something and that, that I always get credit for. That comes from my mom, because that's the type of mom I had. Yep. <laughs> I know. If it was bad or good, you're going to know the, the real, whatever it is, and deal with it. Because that's life, and that's how you got to deal with it. And I'm glad I had that in my life from my mom, and I'm glad I got to pass it down to you guys. Yeah. And, and I think it's important because, you know, for for us, for black folks, we don't we are we are not encouraged. We don't encourage our children to ask questions. Children are to be seen and not to be heard. Mm -hmm. And I remember you would answer our question, even if you I can tell like sometimes you didn't want to because I was the kid that keep asking all everything. the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I know no, I'm a dad. Three. <laughs> I know, no. I'm not surprised you're a psychotherapist. You've been analyzing <laughs> me since you could think about something. <laughs> and you know what? It scares me because now as a father, that's how Z is. Like Z, like, I oh my is. God, Z drives me nuts because all she does is she pays attention. <laughs> she don't miss nothing. She's probably listening through the that's you now. But like, and, and, you know, I have to remind myself that let her just have her process because you mm -hmm. did the same thing. Like, you knew how I was as a kid, but you would answer the questions at a kid level. Yeah. And, I, and that's one of the things that I always, t parents ask me all the time, how do I talk to my kids like this? How do I talk to my kids about this? And I'm like, answer their question. Don't shun them. Answer their question at a kid level where you feel like they're, you know, they're at a level to understand what hey, they're right. asking. Because mm -hmm. when you don't, they're going to go, especially in today's age, they're going to go find out on their own. They'll go ask Siri and Alexa some questions and get some answers you might not want them to. So... And yeah, that's part of that. That comes from coming from a big village too, because I have a big family. Right. I grew up in the house with my my aunts and uncles, and I always had grown. I was always been around grown up, so they never shun nothing from me. I learned from watching their mistakes, 
And then whenever something happened, that's it was just raw. That's how right. that's how it came out. So I knew how to express it to you guys. Right. Okay. Anything else? I don't want to keep you all night tell, uh, telling all our business. No, I know. Okay. And not on this show. We'll have to yeah. <laughs> do another oh. show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Right. Well, any, anything you want to tell them about me? Because people be asking questions. They be thinking I be lying, man. I be telling you, I ain't lying about nah, nothing. This is real yeah. deal. <laughs> Everything he's saying is true. I mean, my friends are like, wow. And my cousins, you know, my family. Wow, he's on there talking about. I don't care. You could talk about whatever we went through because it was real. You know what I'm saying? You can't, yeah. It's not, you're not lying about nothing. It's all yeah. real. It's real. Yeah. It's facts. And that's what happened. Yeah. And and it also shows that healing is possible, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't blame you for nothing, and I never have. Right. It has okay. changed our dynamic. Sure. Yeah, it's our, it's changed our dynamic. But you're still my mom at the end of the day. Yeah, right. And that's what's important. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'm glad you came on because people really don't believe some of the stuff <laughs> I've been saying. And I'm like, I'm trying to tell y'all this is how this stuff works. So, yeah. yeah. But if, any any final words of wisdom you want to drop a gem on anybody before you head out? Um. Just, oh, from my own perspective and what I'm going through right now, for fathers, just be present in your kid's life. Just, even if you, money ain't everything, you don't have to buy kids anything. Just spend time with them, share what you have to share with them. Parent, mothers and fathers, just be mothers and fathers to your kids. Share what you have to share and be real with them and just be there for them. That's all. Absolutely. <laughs> And your parting words should be what you you know, oh, north man. side, north side, right? <laughs> you north gotta say side. That? Yeah, we're going to the Super Bowl, baby. <laughs> Shout out to Tyler Johnson. Yeah, That's Polish. Great, Paul and Minneapolis, for real. We on the we on the map. I got another reason to be proud of home now. <laughs> All right, Mom. I'll talk to you later. Love you. All right, love you too. Yeah, peace. Bye. Look at that. Cross generational healing happening live on Facebook and YouTube. Who thought? Who would have thought it? <laughs> who would have thought it? But again, we have to be able to have these types of conversations as adults, and it's not easy. But when you take the blame out, when you're not blaming individuals, mm -hmm. and you're able to connect and be honest about your experience, and hopefully they can be honest about theirs, that's where the healing takes place. Now, I've never seen. I've only seen it one time. I've seen a father and son have a, a real conversation on YouTube. I've never seen a, a mother <laughs> and son have a real conversation about their experiences on YouTube. So that was interesting. I hope that that was something to give y'all, you know, some insight. Um, but yeah, th this, to me, again, this is a, um, this work for me is both professional and personal. And it's not to call out anybody or to blame or shame anybody. It's to heal, man. Like, this healing stuff is a journey. It's not a destination. I'm still going through my process. As I talked about with my daughter, sometimes I'd be looking at her like, man, this girl, she's too smart. She's just too intuitive to stuff. She scares me. But it's the same stuff my mom would be telling me about who I was. So I'm like, this is just the cycle repeating itself. This is That is the metaphysical journey of recreation right there that I'm experiencing. So again, we have to remember that healing is a journey. It's not a destination. If you, if you are working on yourself, you have to understand that it's a consistent process because as you get older, your life shifts and change. As you become a parent, as you become a partner, you know, as you move from place to place, you know, as you develop new friendships, move in different communities, you're still on that journey and don't lose that. So even when pain takes place, even when pain happens, it's not necessarily going to define who you are, but it is a... a, a like a print or a footprint or epigenetic print on what you've gone through. And that's why I talk a lot about post-traumatic growth. If you're interested in post-traumatic growth, there's a link in the description of a course that I did around post-traumatic growth. Feel free to check that out. So, man, I don't see nobody else popping on, so I'm going to pop out. Um, I hope that that was a good experience for y'all to actually see <laughs> me and my mom chop it up and actually talk about some real stuff. And shout out to April. That's my cousin. Shout out to April. But yeah, um, you know, at the end of the day, again, we have to be able to work on ourselves. We have to be able to be serious about it. You know, whether that's politically or not, we have to be able to take action. 
within ourselves to improve our situations. We can't leave it up to happenstance. We can't leave it up to other people to improve our situation for us. Though the healing work starts within. It's a united, independent effort. You know, if everybody focused on working on themselves, we'll have a better community. But we don't because everybody is pointing the finger saying that person needs help, not necessarily myself. And that's something that we have to be very mindful of is the healing starts within. Um, and, and, and again, sometimes that within process is extremely uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Don't look out the window, look in the mirror. That's where the healing journey starts. So on that note, I don't see any questions. I don't see nobody popping on. So I'm going to pop out. I will see all of y'all next Monday. Um, oh, nope. My boy LeVar just popped up. And I didn't plug LeVar stuff either. Hold up. What's up, LeVar? You're on mute, man. I like that. Door of L. Me, then we. Absolutely. Can I borrow that door, door of L? What's up, LeVar? All right. Hey, hey, what's up, brother? Yeah, I want to jump on, but I uh, got to watch. I'm on my other phone, so it might cut us off here in a little bit. <laughs> oh, no worries. Be careful in that car, brother. Yes, yes. But yeah, this is uh, definitely uh, something I think uh, that definitely hit home for me uh, because uh, I've uh, been, you know, been dealing with my family and trying to understand our trauma within our family. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we, uh, you talked about, I think, a, a week ago, a couple weeks ago, about doing our genealogy. And uh, I've done them genealogy. And not only I did that, but I started asking a lot of questions to my aunts, my uncles, my mom, because it was a lot of I don't knows that came from, from my mom. Uh, but when I started to ask my aunts and my uncles, um, I got more insight about my grandmother and my granddad because they died when I was young. My grandmother died when I was like, like, uh, like two, and my granddad died when I was like, uh, like early, like teenager, you know. But he didn't really talk much. So it was so much that I didn't understand about our, our family, you know, and the things that we have dealt with, and things that we still hold on, and things that we still, uh, uh, the trauma that we still express throughout our family, and just through our pain. So uh, it, it was definitely uh, interesting and interesting conversations you were, saying, you were talking about. But uh, that was beautiful. You and your mother was talking because uh, me and my mother, we talk like that. We have talked like that. Unfortunately, right now, she's not in a mental uh, state where we can have those conversations anymore like right. we used to. But we still do it to a certain extent. But I think this is very important to understand our trauma, to really get an insight on everything like uh, we went through. Like uh, last night, I had a conversation with my aunt because she said some foul stuff to my uh, my cousin. And and it really... Oh, man. He's breaking up. <laughs> we, we get him every time he's driving, man. And he, right when he gets to the good stuff, he starts breaking up every time. Yeah, I think he's. I think we lost him. We'll catch you next time, Lavar. Man, he was. He's about to get ready to share some good, good information about you know him and his, his family, and and having that conversation with his aunts. But yeah, like he was saying, it's important to have those conversations. Uh oh, hold up, we got another guest. We ain't going nowhere just yet. Uh, but make sure you all, before I bring in this next guest, make sure you all check out Helping My Little Brother Hill at gmail.com. That is LeVar Watson's uh, weekly group that he has for black men, or I think it's just for men in general, around healing. If you want more information on that, uh, go to helpingmylittlebrother at gmail.com. So go ahead and send an email there, um, and they'll get you connected to that uh, good experience that we're having around healing men. Greetings, sir. Greetings, greetings. Uh, my question is, is, when is that addicted to white going to be rescheduled? Oh, good question. We actually, I did addicted to white. Um, if you don't see it posted, let me, I'll go back no. and make sure that it was posted. But no, yeah, I did, I, yeah, I, yep, I did it. It's on the YouTube channel. Did you have something that you wanted to add from that or some questions? Well, that was, the, that was the major thing because I know that, uh, you, you know, you had, you know, like men, we always schedule because we can't remember dates well. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so there was a scheduling scheduling conflict that I know you had. So 
Right. Uh, you know, I definitely want to see it. So I, I didn't see it on the YouTube. I had I had looked it up. I didn't see it on there. Uh oh. Did you subscribe to my channel? Yeah. Yeah. I'm subscribed to your channel. Oh, yeah. Maybe maybe it got pull, it got pulled out. <laughs> Let's see what happened. No, it's still there. Yeah, it's it's there three weeks ago. Three weeks uh, ago. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. All right. If you uh check the private chat, I'll plug the link in right there for you. Okay. All right. Gotcha. But you doing good? Gotcha. I, I haven't talked to you. I haven't seen you in a minute. Everything going well? Yeah, everything's going good. You know, I've been wondering, you know, you, you've been, you know, kind of, you know, missing Mondays here. I'm like, <laughs> 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 you know, so, saying a brother can't yeah. stay on schedule, huh? Hey, I'm telling you, ever since you didn't broke up with, 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 uh, Oh. With Felix, man, you, 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 you know you sometime me now. You know, oh. no, I don't. I don't know if me and Philippe broke up. I don't know what happened, and the story should come out. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, I got a look, man. I got a phone call from Philippe. He said he got to focus on his dissertation. So mm -hmm. You're gonna push, push, ask the Jekna over to my channel. I said cool. He said give me about a month. No worries. And I, yep. and I, 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 I called him back. Sent him an email. I ain't heard from him. I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't know, but you know, it's like <laughs> we don't express ourselves very well, so I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I, I hope to be back over there. I thought we we built something great, and yeah, you know, we can come over here, whatever the case may be. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. That that because uh, he's you know I'm, I'm she's still putting content out, so you know he I, I, been I, that I busy so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seen it. I mean, he had a show not too long ago, a couple well, you know, an hour ago. Unless the ish people, I think you know when you had made that those so certain gun comments, that something must have happened. Yeah. Right after you told me gun comments, <laughs> that could have told me <laughs> We need to we need to arm ourselves. We need to protect ourselves and and believe in the constitution like everybody else. That shouldn't scare nobody. I ain't say nothing right. different than nobody else has said, but I understand. Right. You know, the, the hey, people but, probably came after him. But. Hey, yeah, but you got to realize them people had just picked up the other guy that was with the brothers. Oh, yeah, yeah, scared yeah. The gun, so not giving it up true. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you know, whatever, whenever we show uh, defiance. <laughs> They I didn't show no us. defiance. I was just speaking <laughs> at it. I didn't. I didn't pull it. On, I didn't. I didn't show nothing on camera. You know. <laughs> oh, you know, you, was kinda, you was kind of rough. You was kind of rough. You sounded kind of militant there. <laughs> so. now, I can go there if we need to. I'm just saying. I try to. I try to tone it down as much as I can. But at the same time, we can't be punks, man. We gotta protect right. ourselves too. So yeah. Right. Well, you know, you did come out kind of hard, though, man. You know, if you go back and listen. You was kind of like it was. You might have you, you might have figured out what happened. You might have figured out what happened. I'm gonna have to go back and watch the playback. Maybe I was just on one. I think that yeah. was that was super quiet at first. Then I just kind of like. Yeah, you you came out about. hard, and you was like, "I don't care. We need this." You know, that was one and, of those days. <laughs> and Felipe, was, was Felipe was even say, "Hey man, come on now. We don't want to get." <laughs> and you said, "I don't care." We need to. We need to. You said, need, I'm up. "All right, all right." Now, now I get it. We need to get. We need to show these young brothers how to use guns the proper way. They ain't got to not have the guns. They got to learn how to use them. So. <laughs> I said they need to learn how to respect them. And right, maybe, right, right, right. <laughs> maybe that might cure some of this violence that we have because they'll have a different mentality around them. Where, that's a whole nother conversation. We're gonna yeah. let that be where was that. <laughs> that <laughs> is apparently that. it causes disruption. So <laughs> just a radical idea. You know. Yeah, we, we, we don't want this one to get uh, ended as well. <laughs> hey man, look, that's the American way. I'm just saying, why can't we why can't we invest in it like everybody else? That's all I'm saying. It's because we're supposed to be the doormat whenever we stand up. Oh, that's a problem. Uh, that is the problem like with the doormat, but yeah, yeah. so <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if it's a breakup. Um, <laughs> I hope that at some point, if, if it is an issue, that we can talk about it. 
Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's an issue just yet. But I am right. noticing some things that got my eyebrow raised, and I'm a little unclear. So I'll yeah. keep it real on that one. But well, I ain't got no issue. I'm, I'm well, completely good. I don't got no problem. Hey, you're the social worker, man. This is your field. You go in there and 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 fi figure and find figure it out. out. <laughs> That's right. You know, because I'm saying you guys, you guys work too well together. You know, even oh. if it was something, you know. Exactly. Because, you know, because I know that th that one statement that he keeps using that you don't particularly care for, you know, you know, something didn't happen yeah. to, you know. So, you know, maybe yeah. it's a little friction with that statement because uh, you don't necessarily agree with it. But he that's that's his thing. So. <laughs> and that's fine. And with that, we should be able to still support. I think both are true. Right. I think something happened to us and something's wrong with us because we still right. in the situation that we are. But that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That's a whole if, other if, thing. That, if that's the issue, that's sad. But yeah. I'll figure it out. And hopefully, the tr the I don't know if the truth, the we'll get some answers soon. That's probably the best right. thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. I am completely good. I ain't got no issues at all. Because, like, like I said, you, he's the new Tony Brown and, uh, I guess who who would you have been? I don't know who I am. I'm, <laughs> you tell me who you think I might be. I can't think of a good uh, psychologist back then in that, that time. <laughs> you know, Bobby, you're right. They, they kept us. They kept they kept the black psychologists hidden back in the seventh yeah. degree. <laughs> you know? hey, Bobby, you're right, man. He didn't you know, have yeah, a lot of that, but he, that, that man. Whew. Yeah, but see, I didn't know about him coming up, and I didn't know nothing about it until now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he he was the truth, man. So, <laughs> and, and he was doing he was building institutions and doing that work in Chicago. That was important. So, yeah. See, unless, in, especially if you didn't grow up in the, you know, like a major city, New York City, Chicago. I, you know, I grew up in Rochester, so I didn't hear about him. I didn't know nothing about yeah. him, and you know. So. You know, you, these, you know, they, they keep they keep certain information from certain pockets of the country, especially because mm -hmm. Rochester was always a training ground for federal programs. You know, if they want to mm -hmm. test pilot a program, they mm -hmm. shoot it over there at Rochester to see how to how it would do before they unroll it out to the nation. You know, wow. so, yeah. And that's so you no. Got, yeah. yeah. So you got to. Wow. You got a lot, a lot, a lot of political stuff, agendas, you know, got a lot of agendas, backdoor agendas that yeah. happen. So. Mm, interesting. I know that. I'm going to I'm gonna have to do some Googles and see what I can come up with for some the history of Rochester. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, because remember, that's where Frederick Douglass is from. So it's a, right. it's always been a a um, one of the, the, the cities in the forefront. A lot of a lot of people when they went up north. They would go to Rochester. They would hit Philly and all those other places. They would go to Rochester. Then they'd leave. You know, most of them would leave because they didn't want they they would they would keep the city a certain size. They didn't never right. want it to get too big. So right. they had, you know, they they would purposely, because like I said, with those pilot it's programs minutes. they would yeah. push. So they yeah. didn't want the the the, the city because remember, <clears throat> back in the day they did have a basketball team. That's where the Kansas City mm -hmm. Royals. Went basketball to. team was Rochester Royals at first, right? And they had they had Stokes, who was really good before he passed on. But mm -hmm. you know, and and the city was really growing, but the 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 structure of the government reined it back in to keep it. Mm -hmm. They always wanted to keep it about two hundred thousand area. That yeah. was the sweet. That was the sweet pocket for them. You know, so. More manageable. Mm, that's, yep, that's yep. Fascinating. And I bet you there's other cities like that throughout the United States for different yep. reasons. Is to keep right. it stagnated like that. That's yep. that's fascinating. Yeah, it is. Cool, but that, that, but that just that just shows you we we we, we in a petri dish. <laughs> I mean, to a certain extent, all of us are. Some of us yeah. are just in you know different segments of the laboratory. So <laughs> right. that's kind of that's kind of how this stuff is working out, man. But yeah, but I appreciate you coming on. Um, thanks for the support. I did drop that link in the private chat, so you should be able to okay. access um, that right. episode. But yeah, man, definitely tune in and gotcha. definitely come back. Will do. All right. Well, he bounced out before I could bounce him out. Aaron, whenever you're ready, brother. <laughs>
He's eating. You want me to put you back? <laughs> I'm good. What's up, baby? <laughs> What's good, man? I was, I'm going to email you after the show so we can talk later this week, too, man. I know I keep, I, I done said that two weeks in a row, and he just talked about me rescheduling stuff. So now I'm real black. Now I ain't got my time right. I'm going to tell people time. You see me time. You late on time. You everything. You, you. <laughs> nah, but I um, what's it right? No, but um, what's the um? You you ask people about for different topics this week. So what are we talking about? Yeah. So today we were talking about um, cross generational healing and cross generational trauma, and then somebody also wanted me to talk about political seriousness, or really just like somebody wanted me to talk about the twerking that took place on um. The talking that took place on the nation's capital, and then somebody else wanted me to talk about just us being better politically um, and being more involved in the system, so we can make systematic change. But any thoughts on any three of those topics? Well, I ain't gonna lie. When the when the twerking one first popped up, <laughs> I thought people were trolling because uh, my girl had sent it to me, and she was like, "No, I sent it to her." And she said, do you know this is really on the Black Lives Matter page? Like the yeah, official page. Right. And I was like, well, y'all just stop this foolishness. Like, what are y'all? Right. And I went and I said. Wow. What does Mr. Fuller say? And, the <laughs> but Brandon, the most, the, most, the most interesting thing was that dude. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. There might have been 500,000 comments on that page. Mm -hmm. 499 of them were take yeah. this down. Yeah, get that out of here. Right. And they still didn't take it down. They turned the comments off. I don't know if you went back to see. Oh, they did? Yeah, you couldn't, you cannot continue to comment on that tweet. And I'm just sitting there like, these aren't white people talking, saying take it down. This is Black Lives Matter. These are black people saying this is inappropriate content. Why is yep. it still up? It yep. makes zero sense, man. It just, and that was, but you know, it's, that should tell people that these organizations are not in your best interest right. to, to continue to have that that kind of content is going to be there. And like and, and listen, it, there's a time and place for everything. That just right. wasn't it. No, that's like this is yeah. like this is should be supporting that. Yeah, it should not be supporting on MLK. It's like, dude, what are we? Yeah, it was on MLK. Then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Like so serious who, about not being serious, man. Yeah, not serious about not being serious. Um, the political stuff was um, um, I mean, obviously everybody saw what happened last week. I mean, there's there's definitely a um, I, I don't want to say I was happy or sad. I was a little um, I can say I had a smirk in seeing. I've I've been a strong advocate for seeing. I want to see more female energy. Um, yeah. In some way, shape, form, or capacity, somebody might say Kamala is not the best example of female sure. energy uh, that we need up here. But I just think that men have done a really, uh, from what I can see, kind of poor job across the planet. We're behind. Mm -hmm. If you think about the United States as a nation, um, sure. uh, other countries have women leadership, have had it for for years. And for this to be the first example to have female leadership, I mean, I think it's a good thing, but it needs to happen a little bit more. Um Black people being serious involved in political, I don't I don't necessarily know what people want to do aside from that you have to decide if you really are serious about destroying the system, which means that you need to establish your own political right. group. Right. You right. know, your own political group. And I know I talked to a white guy that's um, I think his family is from like the Netherlands, and he told me, Man, Aaron, there's like 50 parties that show up every yeah. year for an election. That doesn't mean they get things done very well. <laughs> but, but you got representation and options. Yeah, yeah, but there's options available. So I think if people want to get away from it, they just have to make that conscious decision. But um, yeah, man, I just wanted to pop in. I know you guys are probably rolling. Um, but yeah, good content as usual. But everything has just been kind of weird. Um, I, did you watch any of the games yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. think we had I think we had 30 different more interracial relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they brought the full I can't wait to the Super Bowl commercial. Oh, bro, it's, it's gonna be, be listen. It's, it's about to be, be um what is it? Not, I keep calling that show Brimington. Bridging oh, Brimington. Bridging. Yeah, yeah. It's about to be that times like ten thousand boy. We I'm telling you, man. I, I think I I think I've gotten to a point where I'm like, this ain't just my thinking. Like I think this is actually happening. 
this this uh this mixing is is happening. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It might be what we need to be honest. We might be so yeah. far down the rabbit hole that we might just need to keep blending. Cause boy, it, it's on full full fledged visuals at this point. I was like yeah. Toyota, Kia, Chrysler, every car, every car Mercedes. Mercedes. <laughs> if you got a car, you gonna yeah. see. And then the dynamics. The dynamics are so interesting too because I saw, I did see, I saw. Black male, white female. Then yep. I saw a uh, white male, black female. I think I even saw like an Indian, saw Chinese, or something like yep. that. I was like, this yep. is so, and it's so intentional. It's so yes. intentional too. It's it's to again, and this is why I think that sh that show that I can't pronounce is it Bridgington, Brit it's whatever. I, Netflix, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I think that 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 was strategic. I don't want to say strategically done. Shonda Rhimes does not say because that's her content. So we have to yeah, be that's clear. That's a huge yes. part of her content. Yeah. Yes. And I think that that show is really prepping everybody to be more comfortable with just having people play roles and people be in union with people who are from different ethnicities. And it's not about race. It's trying to deconstruct this idea. I really think that's where we're going is deconstructing this whole concept of race. Because I because well, if you Go ahead. No, no. I was I was going to ask you a question. What would be bad about it? What would be think, bad about pushing that content? I don't. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think it's bad, but I think in the in the circles and sectors that I am in, <laughs> the folks who are watching this, that mm -hmm. is a necessary evil because because we are extremely focused on black development and being pro black. Mm -hmm. My thought process is. And this is something that I've been, you know, gradually getting to is we may be so far down this rabbit hole of trauma that we might not be able to have an all black anything. We might have to we might have to mix in just to survive this. Crazy That's place. interesting. And, and this is where the idea of admixture comes in. It's almost like it's not going to be the same, but this is just an example a real life example. It's kind of like how Brazil set up where it's more of a caste system versus a racial system. But this country is built so much around race more than any other country that I think that's the idea is to push that towards us is to make sure. And really, I don't think that those, I don't think these commercials or even that Netflix show is aimed at us. I think it's really geared towards white folks for them to be more tolerant to other races. Cause I, cause us, we're already, most black people are already cool with anybody. We let anybody in, in our families in our communities in our homes we don't care. We're, we're yeah. usually cool with people. Most we act like that's not the case, but when you think about it, that's not true. It is. We're it very is. inviting. Absolutely. Yep. And 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 typically, white folks are not that inviting. And I think really the Super Bowl ads on that ain't for us. That's for them to have more tolerance towards experiences that other white uh, non-white people have. This is why you're starting to hear and see more things. BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color. This is why you're starting to see all these. This is why this is why they're blackening up everything and they're putting race at the forefront. I think what happened after the murder of George Floyd was there was a a, a period, an opportunity to say, look, this is an opportunity to advance race, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, etc. And they also, and I think there was also a level of fear that we can't continue to have these huge blows to our economic systems. And in our cities, if this stuff continues. Now, there's right. been other things mixed in with it. Antifa and the Proud Boys and yeah. crazy white... Yeah. There's been all types of craziness mixed in with it. But I think that that's what's happening. And I'm telling you right now, in these professional circles, corporate, government, nonprofit, it's full steam ahead on anti-racism. Even organizations that don't, quote-unquote, need anti-racism because they have decent diversity, they're doing anti-racism work. So it's shifting the mindset. It's already been done on, on college campuses for years. It's now spreading out to the masses. Mm -hmm. so, you think, do you do so with you saying all of that, what does the uh quote unquote what is what is the <laughs> I guess you kind of answered it, but I'm thinking about the response from the uh quote unquote conscious community and how are they handling all this? Well, the conscious community one needs to focus on the trauma that's in the conscious community. That's right. what's holding right. us back. And, right. and so, so the focus is victim. This is what they're doing to us. What I'm saying is they're not thinking about you. This is for the masses. <laughs> Conscious community is so stuck on being victimized, which we are victims. Don't get me twisted. Right. But 
But we're so used to harm being done us that sometimes we don't see the play that it ain't for us. I don't think that this is for us. I think this is for them to be more, quote unquote, taller. I use that word strategically of other people. I also believe this is going to redefine what black is. And I think we're seeing this take place already. Who's the, who's the, who's going to win the Super Bowl next week? Let me ask you a question. Who do you think is going to win? Uh, the light skin, the light skin dude. <laughs> Where I'm going. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pat Mahomes. He's a bad this boy. The, this is the new black. That's the new black. Pat Mahomes. Um, you know, uh, Levin, who's won a dunk contest. Levin's one of the most popular basketball players because he's won two dunk contests. He's been on trash teams his whole career. <laughs> facts, facts. Remember facts. my team being one of them. Right. But there's a re but he has marketability. Right. Right. We have Steph Curry is one of the I, I shared a post just you know being an a-hole on Facebook, and I and I was like, man, these Steph Curry shoes is trash. And then I realized these ain't for me. He's marketing to a global market, not to me in the hood, because I'm not his demo. That's the new black. He's the new Jordan when it comes to marketing. It's not LeBron as we think. LeBron's for us, LeBron's good in the states. But when you get outside the states, this the new black Steph Curry. Lamelo's gonna be the next one, right? The whole ball family. Let's jump to tennis. What's homegirl's name? Who's killing everybody? The uh, Haitian and or she Jamaican? Jamaican and Japanese young woman. Oh, uh, Ozaka. I can't remember her name. Yeah, yeah I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The black. Yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody yeah. say that when Serena Williams had a <laughs> had a. <laughs> they ready right. for that baby to play tennis. Who did they have on ESPN like a month, maybe two months ago? They were featuring Tiger Woods' son. Yeah, they were. They were. Yeah, yeah, Th they were. This is it. That's not for us, though. Again, that's for them to help them be more tolerant of this tanning and browning of America. This is what I've been saying. We are. We've been so victimized by this system. We always think the play is on us, but we don't understand the managers. And this is when conspiracy theory branding comes out. But the managers of society know that this can't continue to work for us in this nation. So we got to get them more tolerant. We think gentrification, it, it, now gentrification does hurt black communities to a certain extent, but also gets some stuff done. It also brings white people into black spaces. We don't think of it that way, though. But those white people have to take a rip. Now, <laughs> the crazy thing about it is those white people get a lot of incentives to come into black space. We don't think you're in you're in real estate, so you might know a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. I met this white woman, it's like five years ago. She was like, Yeah, I live over in North Minneapolis. North Minneapolis is where they don't, you know, kind of sectioned off black people in Minneapolis. Okay. She's like, Yeah. So I'm like, where do you live? She's like, I live over in North. And she's telling me about her roommates. I'm like, what the hell? And this is a young white girl, too. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, you live over in North. And I'm like, how did you find this place that you live in? And she was like, Oh, I got um. She's like, I was, I got approached by some company or whatever, and they're saying we're gonna put us in this house, this new development, and I pay like six hundred dollars, and we live in this house, and I'm just like, what? Where did that? That doesn't just happen. Like there's stuff like that happens all the time, and they approach, they brought her in, and I think they got her from like her school or something. They were like, yeah, these people are at my school, and they're, you know, providing homes, and boom, they're over North Minneapolis, and that's how her and her four white roommates lived over North, and North Minneapolis has pretty big homes too, pretty big okay. houses. So anyway, long story short is this. There is, I think that there is a social dynamic taking place that is called admixture. And they're looking at breaking up these black blocks, these black centers of people and mixing with other folks. And I don't think that, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing. It might be necessary given where we're at socially. Now, I'm like, like I said, pro-black spaces, you ain't supposed to say that because everything is right. supposed to be pan-Africanism to the day we die. But when I look at Africans that come here, and I'm in a state where we got a good, decent population of Africans that come here, they're admixing too. I know hella Somali women that are with white dudes. No joke. And and guess what? Somali community ain't really tripping about it. Right. They rather they rather be with a white dude than with me, cause he a American Negro. Mm -mm, that, man, I'm trying to tell you this. This is ha there is a social conditioning or a social structuring that's taking place and and it, and and i think one of the channels that's helped it has been hip-hop music and i was trying to say this on philippe's show weeks ago and what or the show that i did with philippe like weeks ago that mm -hmm. hip-hop has been utilized as a tool of culture of culture transmission 
who's the number who's been we've been hearing this statistic forever? I don't even know if it's still true. Who's the number one consumer of hip hop music? White people. Right. Absolutely. White youth. Right, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're listening to the popular artists. They might not be listening. To the, hell, they're listening to the underground artists more than we are. If we keep it real, <laughs> right, right, yeah. In some spaces, in some spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Now they grew up on this, and now, and if they've been doing that since the '90s, how old are those white people today? They're 30 years old. Right. right? They grew up on hip hop just like we did. They're more tolerant to race relations. Now they may still be racist. They may still do their white thing. They still grow up in a white culture, but they have a different level of connection and acceptance of black culture that their parents did not. So it makes this kind of admixture thing a lot easier for some of the younger white folks. And then they've had Obama as a president. We can talk about if he's really black or not. Now they have Kamala. So you, you get the representation. You get the cultural influence, the representation. You get the media influence. What ends up happening? You start to intermingle. You start to actually just take a chance. So right. that's conspiracy. I'll take my tinfoil hat off. And, <laughs> tinfoil uh, <laughs> koofy like Tariq said. <laughs> I'll take my tinfoil koofy off. Tariq's crazy, man. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> tinfoil koofy. That's damn. my dude, man, because some stuff he's so left with, and then some stuff I'm like, oh, damn, you right. Oh, my God. I man. have not heard him say that is crazy. Oh, tinfoil koofy, yeah. He just, yeah, that's he's. <laughs> you, you, you love him when you hate him. It's like sometimes with Tariq, man, you like this dude, oh, like you've been so left. Man. And then sometimes I'm like, he hit the nail in the coffin. Jeff like, like, it, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff, he calmed down though a little bit. He did, he has calmed down a little bit because he used to go in all the time, but not as much as before. So yeah, yeah. man. Yep, yep. But let me get you out of here, man. Okay. All right. I'll holler at you. I'm gonna send you an email after the show, man. Let's connect this all right, week. cool. Talk all to right, y'all soon. Yep. All right, that was brother Aaron. Me and him are cooking up some ideas and some content. And another brother who's doing good work, Mr. Greg West. What's up, man? Trying to trying to fight this damn uh, pneumonia you're plus fighting. COVID. Yeah, oh, man. man. They, I, they, they, they 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 gonna tell me um, that I got COVID again. I said, how is that possible? They was like, well, that's one of those rare cases. But you know, I'm not even going. Don't uh, you making me about to put on my my conspiracy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, to, I, I was trying not to, you know, really get in, but I had to jump in when, when that, that conversation, the last conversation you and Aaron were just having, because see, like, yeah. I, I, I see, I've seen, I've been seeing the blending going on for a long time, and that's one of the reasons why I, I believe that is important for us to really, you know, do what you were talking about earlier in the show. Like, um, I had a, I have the fortune to have, you know, family history. And understand yeah. where we really come from, because like, as far as we can trace our family back, it's to the shores when we got here. I don't know nothing about you know, so yeah. but you know what I'm saying. But to get to the healing, so that we understand what's really going on, what is I agree what you said earlier in the show that we need to start learning about our family dynamics. That's what's going to heal our community to understand. This is why some of it happens. But the blending though, man, the blending part, man, is real, real significant and what's going on. Cause I know, like you said, you know, for anybody who's never been to Minnesota, they don't know what you're talking about. That right. shit's real up there, man. Right. You know, uh, it's real up there. And even here in Ohio, it's, it's real here too. Cause you know, like uh, we make fun of all, like uh, we like, uh, we make fun of a lot of people. We say all the racists got uh, mixed grandkids now. So how you like that right. shit? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. and, you know, and, 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 and you know, and, and it's it's been going on since my generation, you know, because yeah. I'm a generation before you, and yep. it, it, it started becoming more fashionable and, and, and sociable. That you know, what I'm saying um, that you you would see a, a, a white man and a, 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 a black man, I mean, woman together and stuff like that. Yeah, we used to dog the brothers and be like, how come if you're going to go get you a white woman, how come it always got to be a fat white woman? Why can't you go get one that look like something? <laughs> but as things have changed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They started coming up with these, you know what I'm saying, uh, Kim Kardashian looking models. <laughs> so the blending is real, man. And, yeah. and, and like I was saying in the in the comments, I believe a lot of the reason why America is doing the blending is because you know, like they they first they starting to realize that the Bacon's Rebellion experiment from separating everybody has really failed them as a culture. 
and, right. and it's failed them economically more than anything. You got to remember something about this society here. America was built on one thing or two things, violence and money. Yeah, and power you know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and when they starting to see that, you know, how much they're missing yearly by, you know, what I'm saying all of this redlining and all of this other economic depression that they've done on us and stuff like that. They got to start training their people again. They're, they're, they're indoctrinating like, oh, it's OK to go spend money over there. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, black businesses. Right. Go support black businesses. You'll see you'll see white people support you know, talking about support black businesses more than you see us our, our own people. You know what I'm saying? Every day. And, and, and it's <laughs> There's a black crazy. business in my house that white people support more than, than right. the people in support. <laughs> and, and, you know, in my community, what I'm doing now, like it's, it's crazy that, you know, a lot of the people that I'm dealing with. I would love to say that, you know what I'm saying, to all black people and everything like that. A lot of my resources that I've come uh, I, I've come across are been through white people, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And at first I was like, you know, OK, I don't really want to mess with them. But, you know what I'm saying, because I still had that mindset like, oh, they're just doing it like here. Let's give this little nigger boy you little, you know, because, yeah. you know, because of, uh, of my past trauma, you know what I'm saying, from, you know what I'm saying, right. things that happened. But now what I'm starting to see is like what you say is it's part of the culture shift because, you know, this is their way of generating this economy. Because right. once they put money back in our community, they know that we're consumers. They right. know that their money ain't going to stay with us long. Is the, yep. the dollar is going to stay with us, what, 1.5 seconds or something? I mean, 1.5 right. minutes or something like that. So they, they don't care. They're like, yep. we go ahead and we'll support them because it's coming back to us anyway. And we just got to make we got to make the rest of middle America feel safe to go do it. So, yeah, go put the light skin Greg out there. He's yeah. safe. Not knowing <laughs> that I'm the more most militant person that we deal with. But I got I know how to code switch. You know, right. what I mean? And that's the thing that we need to learn more in the black community and the conscious community is how to turn that on and off, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't call you see, and, and, well. You could call a Sam and uh, 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 Uncle Tom, and if you want, because then that's the wrong terminology anyway. Because Tom was the one that was helping the uh, the slaves. He he, <laughs> he, was, he was beat the women, and he was telling right. the slaves. Well, now right. if you get to calling them Sambo's, now you might be on to something. Right. You know? <laughs> but yeah, man, it, you know, right. we, there's a lot of that going on. I've been watching those commercials, man. Like you know, what I'm saying, and 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 for the longest, I didn't never see a black man with the white woman. I always seen the white. I mean, the white man. And the, but now I'm starting to see the, the yeah. shift, the subtle yeah. shift. Like it's safe to date a black person now. Yep. He can't be too dark now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. Yeah. But but again, and and it's been. I mean, it's subtle. It's been subtle, but it's now it's more in your face. Right. And and it's and I don't and again I'm still trying to figure out is it a is it a bad thing I don't know if it's a bad thing or not. Um and you're right about the code switch. One thing and I I try to say this every time code switch comes up, you can code switch and still maintain black centered and be who yeah. you are. And I don't think people realize that. And again, it's because of our because of us being victims. Uh, and then we adapt the victim mentality. We don't think we can do. I see it all the time, especially in Minnesota. I see it all the time where people are who they are, but they, they will get the business done, but they are still themselves. And I think what separates those folks from, quote unquote, coons is that they start changing who they are to fit in with someone else. And that's the difference. You don't have to change. But Dr. Edwin Nichols told us a long time ago, you go to work, uh, you go to work black, you work, you at work, you're white, then you come back home, you're black, you know, so yeah. <laughs> that, that's not cooning. That's just calling, that's you know, what survival saying? mechanism. Yeah, right. Survival. You know, that's, 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 that's just called, you know, surviving, paying your bills, you know, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I see it going down, Brandon. And, you know, like we do have, to, we as a conscious community have to come to understand that, you know what I'm saying? Look, we don't have to sell out who we are to still be, you know, if we, if, if you want to, I don't care, military mind and everything tell you, if you want to win a war, you better know the enemy. Um, absolutely. <laughs> so how's the best way to, you know what I'm saying? And we've been, we've been behind enemy lines long enough that we should already know their tactics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We should, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We, you know, we, we should know their tactics. So we need to, you know, you know, we need to learn how to uh, be okay with the, uh, you know, we're playing chess out here, but we still playing it with a checker mentality and wonder why we yeah. keep getting our asses knocked off the board. And, and we can't, we can't believe that 
they're not studying up. I mean, they study us. They study everything. They study the types of sand at the bottom of the ocean. Man, they study everything. Like yeah. there, there are there's something called white papers, which is funny because <laughs> they're called white papers. Right. These things come out every right. month from right. various right. different places, and they have information in them that is critical information, and we just don't know about it. Right. But they just always researching and studying how we move and what we do. This is why these things are taking place. They figured out how we are culturally, and they've utilized. It's like, it like, 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 right, like a lot of us didn't know nothing about the ACE, the ACEs test that you were talking about. I found out yeah. about it like three years ago when I first started preparing myself to do this, you know, the research to start felons with a future. I was, uh, you know, and, and some of the stuff that I do for the unions and stuff like that, you know, and I didn't realize that, you know, they've done these tests on us for years. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For years, you know, the, the, when they started going to systematic testing and stuff, this was part of us, the, uh, of them doing the testing to find out what's really going on with us in our community and how fucked up we are and everything. Like, we're the last ones to find, find this stuff out because, you know what I'm saying, we're allowing our trauma to get in the way of our growth because we're still, like you said, the victim mentality. We're mad at the world. And instead of trying, you know, I'm glad, like, listen, I'm glad that we're finally getting so many people talking about healing of the trauma and trauma and trauma. And we're finally getting so many people because this is where we're really getting to the birth of uh, the healing of our nation for real. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And we have, and we again, we have to be able to start with ourselves and and not get locked in a victim mentality. Just right. because you were victimized doesn't mean you have to have a victim mentality. Those are two big different things, and I think that that's one thing that keeps us caught is we have. And this is what I was talking about in that addicted to white episode. We have become so accustomed to white favor and the white standard that we don't know how to disconnect from that. That's a part of our healing journey is that disconnection, and we have to understand. We have to understand that you can heal, exist, and be healthy and not, you know, have your life evolve around whiteness. That's a concept that can be shifted and broken. And that's and that's what I do agree with when it comes to um, black consciousness is that we don't have to have that. But we also can't get into a space and a place where we get caught in victim mentality and think everything that's done to us is done to us strategically. Because sometimes white folks just luck up on stuff. They ain't, <laughs> they ain't that damn smart. They ain't. <laughs> no, I, I deal with a lot of them. They ain't. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't get it. I mean, don't get it twisted, man. They're still and, and again, they're not all that healthy either. White people got some messed up stuff going on. Right. And <laughs> so there, 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 one thing between a difference between us and them, they have realized for years the importance of going on somebody's couch and talk about that shit, though. To a certain extent. Right, to a certain extent. You know, they you know, they're human just like we are, you know what I'm saying? There's still some stuff that they have, you know, their pride and their ego won't let them get out there and talk about. But for the most part, man, they have been they've been utilizing, you know what I'm saying, that the psychology the psychologists and the psychiatrists for years, you know what I mean? We're, sure. we're just not, now we're just not getting to the po point of understanding that it is some healing in it. You know, and, and and you don't have to go to a licensed therapist. You just better learn how to start talking to somebody about start, what's going on. Start somewhere. Right. And, and and what they're and to add to your point, they're good at using their resources to solve their problems. Right. And we're good at we're good at piecing together resources to solve ours individually. As we have to collectively come together to solve our collective problems and understand that we all share these things. That's why. I was talking about we all have this kind of genetic imprint of the trauma and understand that that's a reality for us. And we got to be able to connect with one another to solve those issues. So it's conversations like these that hope hopefully that kind of sparks the ideas of how to do that. And there's different ways to do it. There's not one particular way because our trauma is not one particular way. There's it's complexity in all of this. So, man, I, any I'm going, I just I had to come in man, for a minute, man. I. This 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 COVID slash pneumonia thing, I don't know what to make of it, man. Man, well, get some rest, man. Well, you know, I've been resting, some vitamin yeah. C, yeah. For sure. And and take care of yourself, man. We can't have you bedridden, man. You got too yeah. much important work to do in Ohio. Oh yeah, and I'll talk with. I'll I'll be on next week. I, I I thank you for all you do, Brandon. For real, oh, absolutely, man. I'll holler at you later. Peace. All right, peace. All right, folks, now I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for those folks who came on to share. Before I close out, I want to share Nicola's book one more time. Let me find it. There we go. I think. Uh oh, Let me see. 
Maybe I can't share one more time. It's hating. And uh, we will see you next time on Ask the Jegna. I think me and Philippe are good. I don't know. I'll find out this week and get back to y'all next week. But <laughs> it's not no bad blood on my end. So if you have questions about that, <laughs> I don't know. But we had a pretty interesting episode. I had my mom come on, uh, which is always interesting. Uh, but that's what Hitler looks like. And hopefully we, are, we were able to inspire all of you um, to have those conversations with your family as well. Until next time, peace.